A few housekeeping items before we start. Participants handouts are in the session under the Patent Literacy Symposium in Schoology. The session handouts are in the folder for today, June 11th, in the time slot for this session under the name of the session. This session is 75 minutes long. The chat feature will be off between participants, but you will be able to chat with us if you have any needs. Please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. Dr. Gillis has requested that we use the last five minutes for questions. Please chat your content related questions to us during the presentation and we will select as many as possible to be addressed during the last five minutes. We would love for you to tweet out or share on social media all you are learning from the symposium. The hashtag for the Patent Literacy Symposium is hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. And now I would like to introduce you to our ses session's presenter. Dr. Margie Gillis currently serves as the president of Literacy How Incorporated, a 501c3 organization that provides comprehensive evidence-based professional development, classroom support, and literacy coaching. Dr. Gillis comes to us with 45 years of professional experience. She also serves as a current research affiliate with Haskins Laboratories. She has co-authored and co-authored and presented over 50 professional publications and presentations. She has also contributed to years of policy work in the state of Connecticut. Dr. Gillis's areas of expertise include educational administration, reading instruction, professional development, and consultation with schools. Over the past 20 years, she has led and collaborated with multiple teams on various literacy-related grants. We are so honored to introduce you to Dr. Margie Gillis as she shares her expertise regarding grammar and syntax, the building blocks of comprehending and writing sentences. Thank Take you. it away, Dr. Gillis. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. I appreciate it and your support. Um, it's very nice to see all of you, um, or at least your names. And um, if you were in the morning session, um, you know that the syntax morning session, we had a little bit of technological technology issue. So hopefully, so far so good, we'll be good to go on this, on this session, or in this session, I should say. So I'll share my screen. And um, I just will preface a little bit of this presentation by just telling you how and why I am here today and how we got, got to where we are. Um, and I'll allude to some of our work as we go through this, but Literacy House started um, in 2009 at the, uh, because I had been working at Haskins Laboratories and applying the research through some federal and state grants. And what we were doing was um, really translating the research for teachers in their classrooms. And the work was fantastic, but unfortunately the grants started to dry up and I had an amazing team of people that I was working with. Um, we call ourselves mentors, basically coaches. And I just couldn't bear to think about not being able to continue the work. So, and the work was primarily working with gen ed teachers in their classrooms. And they really were so enthusiastic and supporting and getting support that that was really the motivation to continue the work. Anyway, long story short, um, as we went into teachers' classrooms and showed them lessons on phonemic awareness and phonics and this and that, um, we knew that we had to give them the tools, the, the, you know, the goods to get the job done. And at one point, not long after leaving Haskins and, and starting Literacy How, you'll see a slide um, that shows our reading wheel. We decided to replace fluency with syntax. But of course, that meant that we had to develop tools for syntax. And uh, William Van Cleve, and I'll you know, talk a little bit about him at the, uh, toward the end when I share resources, was great. He built my team and my background knowledge about writing and um, grammar and how to teach it in engaging ways. So what you'll see today is just some of the things that we have used to support 
teacher's knowledge of syntax. Most teachers will tell us they learned a little bit of grammar when they were in school, but they, most of them will tell us that they did not learn it um, well, and they certainly don't feel and didn't feel comfortable teaching their kids grammar. They didn't like the way they learned it. They didn't want to teach it that way. So hopefully you'll get some tips for how to teach kids about grammar and syntax. They are the building blocks of comprehending and writing sentences. And a little bit about literacy, how we empower teachers with knowledge. We are not a program. We do not have a program. We really take what schools are using to teach reading um, and all literacy, and we help teachers use the methodologies that they have um, to more effectively and enhance what they're doing. Because we really believe at the end of the day, it's the teacher, not the program, that teaches the child to read and write and spell. And our core values drive us and guide us. Um, and so without further ado, I'll, I'll just explain what I'd like to cover today, the objectives for today are to to help you understand these building blocks of syntax, what most people refer to as parts of speech. What are they and how should we teach them? And then why is syntax important in the first place? How does it relate to kids' reading fluency and comprehension and writing? We believe it does in substantive ways. Well, we wanna show you why it relates and how it relates and then most importantly what you can do to improve those aspects of reading um, through these instructional activities that i mentioned so i'm going to start with a picture um, probably a painting that you may have seen this painting uh, was painted by winslow homer in 1891 and this passage that relates to the painting is that you can find it on the ReadWorks, ReadWorks website that I've put here. Most of you probably know it and use it. It's great. Um, and I'm going to ask you to just take a minute. Um, you can jot it down if you have a piece of paper. Just I'd like you to try to find these parts of speech. Okay, and I've listed adjective, adverb, conjunction, determiner, or article, preposition, pronoun, and verb. Okay, so I imagine that most of you found at least some of those uh, parts of speech. Actually, seven are listed here. There's an eighth one um, that'll be surprised in a little bit as we go through the presentation. So this is one sentence that has um, lots of words. And as I say, one or more of each of these parts of speech. Um, I would ask you, what kind of sentence is this? So we, can, we talk about simple sentences, compound and complex. So do you know the difference between and among those three types of sentences? And can you identify what type of sentence this one is? Okay, and then I would also ask you to jot down an adverbial phrase. So I'll give you a minute to do that. If you, if you know what an adverbial phrase is, if you can identify an adverbial phrase, and then jot down an adjective phrase. Now this isn't how I would teach your students, okay? I'm really, this is kind of a mini anticipation guide just to see how good you are with, with grammar and syntax, how, how good you are. That's, that's not very good grammar. How well informed your knowledge about grammar and syntax is and how skilled you feel to teach that to your students, okay? So now I'm gonna give you the answers to these questions, okay? Um, this is a complex sentence, and I'm going to explain the difference uh, between simple and compound and compound and complex. Um, and I have not underlined the adverbial phrase, but I've put the adverbial phrase in blue after a successful deer hunt is an adverbial phrase. It's a phrase that acts like an adverb. And the adjective phrase that I identified here is rugged young hunter okay 
actually it's rugged young, uh, not hunter, hunter is the noun. So the adjective phrase is rugged young, or if you said, oh yeah, rugged young, that's also, that could be part of the phrase. All right. Um, no presentation for me would be complete without showing the beautiful reading rope. Um, and the reading rope shows the simple view as decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. So our decoding related strands are at the bottom of the rope. Our language comprehension strands are at the top of the rope. And today we're going to focus on the language structures of the top of the rope language comprehension. What, um, what do children need to know about syntax? Uh, semantics is part of that. We're really gonna focus on syntax today. And some of you may have seen our Literacy How Reading Wheel that has the core components of literacy um, included around it. And some of you know that what inspired this reading wheel was the National Reading Panel when we started our work at Haskins in 2000. Those five big ideas um, were the original reading wheel and in the last 20 years, we revised the reading wheel. Relevant to today's session, we replaced fluency, which was one of the National Reading Panel's five big ideas, with syntax. And I hope that by the end of this session, you'll know why we did that, okay? But syntax referring to sentence level skills. So what is the role of syntax in reading? Well, Jane Fell Green, who is an author for of language, exclamation mark, talks about the inadequate ability to process syntax of language that results in the inability to understand what is heard, so language comprehension, and what is read, reading comprehension. And beyond knowing what the words are and being able to read those, decode and recognize those words, it is the single most powerful deterrent to listening and reading comprehension. If you don't have good syntax knowledge or syntactic knowledge, it can adversely affect um, intelligence and ability measures. So it's really a big deal. And if we think about syntax in the brain, I always think about Marianne Wolf when I think about the brain. She's taught me so much about the brain and building the neurocircuitry so that we have skilled readers and writers who can read any text you put in front of them and appreciate what that text says. Um, and this quote is so, I think, so relevant to this topic. Words need a structure to reflect our thoughts and structures need words to give them meanings. So, and this book, Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century, does a beautiful job of explaining all of the intricacies of building this reading brain. Um, and then Chomsky, a famous linguist, also talks about syntactic knowledge, which he talks about growing over time and with exposure to more sophisticated types of reading. If you're an avid reader like I am, um, you have been developing and are continuing to develop your syntactic awareness and syntactic, and syntactic knowledge. And that's going to contribute to proficient comprehension. So this, this picture really shows that syntax can be considered the bridge between word reading fluency, that is reading words accurately and automatically, and understanding the text, being able to construct meaning while you read. In order to do that, right, you have to be able to phrase, right, to be able to, to put, um, to, to parse the sentences that you're reading and phrase them so that you're reading very prosodically versus word by word. And when you do that phrasing, which leads to the prosody that we want to hear when children are reading out loud to us, you actually are able to make meaning more effectively. Years ago, we had a different bridge, um, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, but this is our current way of thinking about syntax. Children who have good grammatical awareness actually are better able to monitor their comprehension. 
uh, sorry, mo well, monitor their comprehension, but also monitor their oral reading accuracy. When children are phrasing and really paying attention to those noun phrases and those verb phrases and those prepositional phrases, when they say a word incorrectly, they immediately correct it because they're, they're knowing that it doesn't make sense in that context. You're also going to see as this presentation unfolds how grammatical awareness and reading fluency are related. So these are also important relationships. But let's start with the sentence because that's where we best begin with little kids. And we start with little kids with pictures of a doer, right? A namer, someone who does something and the action that they do. In this picture, in this painting, we have a hunter who is pausing. Our namer, you know, who the sentence is about is a hunter. And what is he doing? He's pausing, right? So that is the, the, the kernel sentence, a namer and an action. And that's what we teach our little ones, our kindergarten children immediately teach them about namers and actions. And that knowledge is going to help them expand sentences in very descriptive ways, first at the oral level and then in writing. But as children grow and develop and move into the higher grades, we wanna teach them the technical names of these things. Before I get into that, I'm gonna show you a video. Um, and this is on our YouTube channel, so um, I know that Dawn had put uh, our YouTube channel link in the chat room, our chat box. Um, we could probably do the same thing, ask our facilitators to do that. You'll find lots of videos in that or on that YouTube channel. And you can sort of see what this, um, this instruction looks like across the domains. But here's a little five minute video, maybe six minutes of a kindergarten classroom. This is Elkie Blanchard, um, one of our mentors, working with a small group of kindergarten children and really helping them to understand this whole concept of a sentence. Look, they're all right here too, with the letters that it goes with. So today, now that you're warmed up, you know what our vowels say, right? You're not going to have a difficult time reading these words. So I'm going to have you read some words. You have to decide if the word that you're reading tells me who. So that means it could be a person, a place, or a thing, or an animal. Or does it tell me an action? Is my word an action word that I'm reading? All right. So let's read this first word together. Oh, let's find our CR. That was fast. Is run, is that a who or is that something we do? Yeah. It's something we do. Can you put it under the do column, please? Huh. Okay, is it a who or is it something we do? Yeah. Can you hop, make your fingers hop? If you can make it happen, it's something that you do. There. All right, so now we have who's. And we have do's. And in order to make a sentence, you have to have a who and a do. You get to choose who you want to talk about and what they're going to do. And we're going to start off our sentence where we're going to say with a capital letter. So now say this. The frog swims. Good. You want to use it? Pull that over. All right, and look what you said, swims, and that's so great. Guess what I have? I have your S there because we don't say the frog swim. We say the frog swims. And then what do I have to, what do you think is on my last card? Yeah. All right, can you say your sentence now? Go ahead and the say it. The frog swims. Okay. Have your students say it. You're the teacher. Say, it. okay, everybody, say the sentence. Okay, everybody, say the sentence. The frog swims. Okay. Now, can you add to it for me? Can you tell me where he swims? Who could tell me where he it's swims? In the pond. In the pond? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put these out. 
in the pond. Good. Let's read that sentence now. Ready? Go. The frog swims in the pond. I'm going to change it to this. Now, what does the sentence say? Read the sentence to me. The frog swims. And let's go back to in the pond. Let's change it to not just in the pond. Let's change it to in the big. Why don't you be big or little? Big. big. The big pond. Okay. Ready? Go ahead. The frog swims in the big pond. Now, let's say this together. The frogs. And then let's say this. Swim. And then let's say all of this together in the big pond. So save that as a chunk. Ready? We're going to do this. One. The frogs. And instead of saying the frogs, say the frogs swim in the big pond. Say it this way. In the big pond. Good. Ready? Let's now you do it all by yourselves. The frogs. And say it this way. The frogs. And when I say the frogs, now we don't say swims, now we just say swim. If I say the frog, then I have to say swims. That's funny. Let's try it that way. What's this way again? In the big pond. In the big pond. In the big pond. Ready? Go. The frogs. The frogs. Swims in the big pond. All right, the dog. What is the dog going to do? Uh, he's sit on the floor. He's sit on the floor. On the floor. Okay. Uh, let's move that over here like this. On the floor. What kind of floor does he sit on? A hard, a soft floor? A hard floor? No, a hard floor. On a hard floor. All right, ready? Let's read it. The dog sits in the hard floor. Let's count and see how many words we have in this sentence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven words? Oh my goodness. Seven and with the, with the period. Look, when you come up to a seven word sentence, it's a seven up. It's seven, seven word sentence. It's a seven up with the period. Okay, so you can see um, that in that lesson, Elkie packed a lot of a lot of stuff in that lesson, and of course we cut it to annotate it and to call out certain things that we wanted to call your attention to. And unfortunately, in this kind of a session, I can't ask you to tell me what you saw. Um, but as you're thinking about what are some of the things that you noticed that Elkie did um, that would promote the student's oral language. Right? She had the kids reading. She had the kids trying to read with some prosody. She also worked on subject verb agreement. Um, these are kindergarten children, so we're going to be doing a lot of this work at the oral level. In fact, the namer and verb activity, the who do, we often just start with pictures. So we would have a picture of a, a who, like a person or, a, or an animal, and then an action. Um, you could see somebody running or jumping or fishing or swimming. And then we would ask the children to select a who and a do and create a sentence that way. Um, we also noticed that she was, again, trying to work on the expansion of the verb. So she asked them to expand, where do the frogs swim? And you'll see how we do more of this um, as we go through the presentation. 
So essentially what you want to teach children is the concept of a sentence having two parts. Now, I laugh when I see this because when I ask children and I go into classrooms a lot, or our, our, our uh, mentors go into classrooms a lot, what do you think they tell us when we ask them what a sentence is? Okay, so hopefully many of you are, are answering this way, because this is what I hear 90% of the time. It's a, it has a capital letter and a punctuation mark, or they'll usually say it has a period. So it starts with a capital and ends with a period. And I always laugh, because I, and I say to them, you're right, a sentence does begin with a capital letter and it ends with a punctuation mark, and it's often a period, but that doesn't tell me what it, is what is it a sentence and and if you tell and a lot of kids will say it's a complete thought but isn't that sort of an abstract idea what does that even mean to a five-year-old it's a complete thought so we have to be really concrete and tell them a sentence has a, a doer and an action a who and a do and eventually as i mentioned earlier when they get to you know second grade we would talk to them about those two parts are called the subject and the predicate. Every sentence has to have one of each. And when you're, when kids write fragments, um, like the big dog bark, no, that wouldn't be a fragment, the big um, shaggy dog in my yard. And they might think that's a complete sentence and you'll have to say, well, what's your who? And they have to identify, right? The subject is the who. Do you have a who? Who or what? Yes, they did in that. They had the dog. But what is the dog doing? That's the predicate. Every sentence also has, has to have what the subject is doing. And that's always a verb. And in order to identify that, you would say, well, what is the subject doing? They, if, you, if they can't answer that, if they can't find it, then they have a fragment. So what I'm going to kind of walk us through next are these eight building blocks, what I refer to as grammatical building blocks, otherwise known as parts of speech. A finite number of those, just eight, make it possible to build an infinite number of sentences, of syntactic structures. And each block serves a different function. It's specific, it's meaning-based, and it's really important to constructing sentences that really say what we want them to say. And when we learn all of those grammatical building blocks, that will provide the basis. When our students learn that, that will provide the basis for all of the syntactic structures in English, including simple sentences, compound, complex, et cetera. Compound, complex, we have some sentences that are both. Um, and, and as I mentioned, for young children, kindergarten children who aren't able to read these complex sentences, they can, they can speak them. We want them. We want them to create complex and interesting descriptive sentences just with their oral language. So we're really then focusing on oral languages, which is at the core of reading. So we might begin by teaching a noun. Um, and we will not call that a noun for kindergarten children. We actually call that a namer. And why do we do that? Many, many children, many students learn that a noun is a person, place, or thing. What they often miss in that definition that they've memorized is what it does, right? So to say that a noun is a person, place, or thing doesn't tell us that it names a person, place, or thing. And that's a key component here, that they understand, that students understand that nouns name. And our cueing questions, so they can find these nouns when they, when they speak and when they write sentences, is who or what did it? And so that's the cueing question we might ask. If you look at this sentence that you looked at earlier, um, we have several namers. Okay, but for the, for the actual kernel sentence, who or what did it? Okay, and I'm sure you all answered Hunter, right? Are there any other namers or nouns in the sentence? So if you answered Hunt, you would be correct. 
If you answered dogs, you would be correct. If you answered him, right? Um, actually, him is a pronoun, so forget it. That's not one. So here are your nouns or namers, okay? Um, and you're going to have these namers. Sometimes they're going to be the object of the verb. Sometimes they're going to be the subject of another clause, either independent or dependent. So again, you're going to find usually more than one noun in a sentence. The next building block that you're going to want to teach is the adjective because the adjectives describe the nouns. They tell more about the namers. We've developed an action or an activity around this called namers tell me more. We want children to write descriptive sentences and to speak descriptive sentences. So we want them to tell more about the namers. And we have several adjectives in this sentence that you've seen now. Can you pull them out? How many? Are there any adjectives that tell more about the namer by telling how many? Are there any adjectives that tell what kind to describe the, the noun or the namer? And the other question that you're going to wanna to ask to get children to expand the nouns and the namers are which one? So there are three questions we're going to ask children. How many, what kind, and which one? And in this particular sentence, um, actually a, uh, although it's called an article or a determiner, functions as an adjective. And because it says a, uh, we know that there's just one hunter. What kind of hunter? right? We could say it's a rugged hunter. Which hunter? We could say it's the young hunter. So by asking those questions, we're going to get children to use more descriptive language when they, when they, in their oral language, and then ultimately when they write. It will also help them to understand these sentences, because long sentences, sometimes children get lost in them. So by asking clarifying questions, they'll know more about how this sentence functions and then what it means. We also are going to teach pronouns and pronouns replace or refer to nouns and pronouns can be very challenging for all children, but especially English learners have difficulty with pronouns. For one thing, we have quite a few of them. Here you see uh, nine. Uh, listed. So six of them are related to who and the other three are related to what. Um, actually, yes, um, there there's some that are repeated. So there's actually not nine altogether, but it's the end of the long day. So you get my, you get my drift. Um, there's quite a few of them and children get lost in figuring out what nouns they're either replacing or referring back to. We talk, to pro, talk about pronoun reference, and that's an activity that we've developed to get kids to know how to trace the pronoun back to what it refers to. And we'll talk about that in a little while toward the end of the presentation. But we're gonna use the same cueing questions as we did for the nouns to find the pronouns, right? Who or what? So in this sentence, do we have a pronoun? And which, and the answer is yes. And what is the pronoun in this sentence? Right, it's him. And what does him or who does him refer back to? It refers to Hunter. Okay, so um, just using that same sentence and showing you where these grammatical building blocks are and how they function in relationship to the other words in the sentence. Now, of course, we want to teach verbs. We actually teach verbs and nouns in sequence, so um, I would have taught verbs earlier. Um, but anyway, the point of this is that verbs, most in most verbs, actually tell what the namers do, so that means they're action words. Sometimes, however, they actually are linking, so they might link a, a word with another word and answer the question, is what, right? Um, so 
if it's an action word, let's look for the action words in this sentence. Let's look for the verbs. So we have three of them. We have pauses, bark, and jump. Um, and we do not have a linking verb, but I did write a sentence with a linking verb here just so you have an example. We could say that, that this sentence, uh, the hunter must be tired, which is why he paused, right? So a hunter is tired. Moving on. Now we want to expand the verbs. We want to tell more about the actions that are occurring in these sentences. So there are four questions that we might ask to get children to think about expanding or telling more about the verbs. And these are the four questions. Where, when, how, and why. So I'm going to give you a minute to look for the adverbs in this sentence. And remember, they're going to be answering those four questions. Do we have a where adverb? Do we have a when adverb? Do we have a how and a why? So here are our adverbs and what you'll notice is that we actually have adverbial phrases. So at the beginning of this presentation, I asked you to find an adverbial phrase um, and an adjective phrase. So we have the adverbial phrase after a su <coughs> successful deer hunt that answers the question, when did the hunter pause, right? And then we have another adverbial phrase around him excitedly that answers actually around him answers the question where did the dogs bark and jump it's not about the hunter pausing now it's in another clause of the sentence we have the dogs that are barking and jumping and how are they jumping um, excitedly and where are they jumping around him going back to the hunter so you can see how it's really important that we're helping kids develop this, these questioning, questioning strategies. We're going to ask the questions for them to deconstruct the sentence so that ultimately they can create their own sentences. Once we get through those building blocks, we also want to teach about prepositions. Prepositions can be very challenging for uh, many of our students. And again, a lot of uh, our English learners. And this particular challenge here, um, because prepositions, first of all, there are a lot of them. They're abstract. Dutro and Moran wrote a great paper called Rethinking Reading Comprehension, where they talk about mortar words. And mortar words include prepositions. They're very important words because they signal a relationship, right? either a positional relationship or a posi a, um, position a in time between words. Um, and so we definitely need to teach these, but they're challenging to teach them. And so we, we do want to explain that prep prepositions begin phrases. They can break, begin an adjective phrase or an adverbial phrase um, or even a noun, a noun phrase, right? They begin these phrases that answer, in this case, these adjectival questions, the same questions we asked before. How many, what kind, and which one? Can you find a preposition in this, in this sentence? And I'm sure you can, right? So we have um, next to, right? Right, we have next to. So this signal, this next to preposition signals the relationship between the hunter and where and, and the tree stump, right? He's he's pausing next to the tree stump. Actually, and I I wrote this based on the picture. This isn't the original sentence, but I just wanted to show you an example of an adjectival prepositional phrase. I hope that makes sense. Um, we also have adverbial questions, again, that start with a preposition. 
And in this case, we have a where and a when. We don't have a how, but we have the where, the dogs bark and jump, where, around him. So that's an adverbial phrase, um, and it's an adverbial prepositional phrase. And then when, after a successful dog hunt, a deer hunt, right? Um, again, showing the relationship between pausing and the deer hunt. Um, and this is, I'm building your background knowledge, right? So that you understand how these words function in a sentence so that you in turn can make kids aware of this and you can show them in engaging ways. We put the words on cards, we put the sentences on sentence strips, we cut the sentences up into these nouns or namers and actions, we build the prepositional phrases, we have children write them down and expand the sentences and it really does make this work come alive in the classroom. Now the next Building blocks that we want to make sure children understand are conjunctions. And again, going back to Dutro and Moran's work on identifying mortar words, conjunctions are also considered mortar words. They help the brick words stick or cohere. Or cohere. And those conjunctions, also referred to as cohesive ties, are really important because they join words, phrases, and clauses within sentences. These conjunctions come in two varieties. They can be coordinating conjunctions, and these are our fanboys, and I've listed some here for you to see. Um, a fanboy um, is just an acronym for the seven uh, coordinating conjunctions that join equal parts, right? Either equal words that are equally weighted, or phrases, or clauses that are equally weighted. Um, and then we have our subordinating conjunctions joining unequal parts, where you have an independent clause and then a, a dependent clause that begins with one of these subordinating conjunctions because the dependent clause is dependent on that independent clause. And here are some examples of those, of those uh, conjunctions. Last but not least, we have interjections. In the sentence I showed you originally, we did not have an interjection, but we see these in text. We see them oftentimes in narrative text where a character is expressing an emotion. Um, and so again, these are, this is the eighth grammatical building block of sentences. Now, I did not talk about an article. Um, an article, we saw the articles in the sentence that I shared with you. Articles are also called determiners. So again, just to complete the complement of, of grammatical building blocks. Now, I wanna talk about grammar and syntax in the context of text comprehension because we know that children need lots of practice reading these lengthy sentences. And so this work that we're doing on syntax is going to support their ability to do that. And you have a handout called Sentence Building, and this sentence building activity, um, I'm actually gonna take a minute to show it to you. Um, you'll see it in the handout. And it looks like this. Um, it's uh, several pages where we talk about the objective of the lesson. And the objective of this, um, whoops, is to help children generate complete sentences. And complete sentence might have a subject and a predicate only, or could have a subject, a predicate, and an object. And, and then be able to identify the parts of the sentence that we just spoke about. The subject, the predicate, and then the object, right? Um, dogs bark at cars, right? And so we're gonna target students. Um, actually, we can do this sentence building with pictures with younger students, but this is a, 
a stage two version of the activity. If you're familiar with Jean Shaw's stages, stage zero is a pre-alphabetic stage where children aren't reading words yet, They're, but they can get these concepts and this concept of a sentence using pictures, as I described earlier. Stage one, where they might be reading decodable text because they're still glued to the print. And in stage two, they could read an article for themselves, in this case, about planets and how planets orbit and how planets orbit um, the sun or orbit around the sun, right? So you're teaching um, the complete subject here, the complete predicate. And as I said before, you're doing this, um, we have the subject predicate object, right? Scientists study planets. And what you're doing here is you're taking sentences, cutting them up, putting them on index cards, um, and getting kids to move them around. So you have scientists study planets, um, and then we can expand that. Space scientists study what kind of planets, orbiting planets, and where from the lab, right? And this is just the activity written out for you. Um, so you, step by step, you can walk through this activity with your students. So going back to the PowerPoint, um, I just wanted to share where that is. It's at the end of the PowerPoint. Why are we bothering to do this kind of sentence building? Well, again, it helps them to know how these words function in a sentence. If you go back to your own education, your education when you were learning about nouns and verbs, I would imagine that most of you did what I did, which was underline nouns in, in sentences or circled verbs. You know, what was that exercise all about? I might have been able to identify them, but I couldn't necessarily tell you why it was important to identify them or what, those, what the role of each of those um, parts of speech were and are in a sentence. And it certainly is important for them to to identify, but it's most important that they understand why they're going through and doing that in the first place. Um, this will facilitate comprehension, especially when there's a breakdown in comprehension. These activities not only help them generate and recognize complete sentences, but they also, we take these sentences out of their text. And this is really important for you to think about. If you come across sentences that are uh, challenging for kids to understand. When you lift the sentence out of the text, and let me explain to you that you need to do this first um, and make sure you've worked through the sentence yourself first, and that you know what, this, what type of sentence it is and so forth before you have the students figuring this out um, and build your own background knowledge too, because this is let me tell you, it took us a long time to understand this content well, and we're still learning it. Um, but taking those sentences out of the student's text is really very valuable. So with this sentence building, again, we're gonna start with a namer and an action. So we have a dog herds, but we want the students to build on that kernel sentence. How many dogs are herding? What kind of dogs are they? And which dog is hurting? So we could ask how many? A lone dog. What kind of lone dog? A shaggy lone dog. Which lone dog is it? It's the one with the brown and the white coat. Okay, and as we do this, we engage students in the classroom to answer these questions. And then as each question is answered, we might write the answer down in a card, put it on the sentence, you know, on the pocket chart, expanding the sentence. We're corally, we're going to ask the children to corally read the sentence that they collectively built, okay? And we'll do that with the namer. So we're expanding the namer. And then we're going to want to expand the, the predicate, the action, the verb. So where did the dog herd? How did it herd? When did it herd? And so where did it herd? inside the fence. How did it herd? It did it with a back and forth motion. And when did it do it? It did it every afternoon like clockwork. And look at that beautiful long 
descriptive sentence that you've created, that you've built um, through these questions that you've asked to help the student expand the namer and the action. Now, earlier I mentioned that we took syntax out of our reading wheel, sorry, we took fluency out of our reading wheel and replaced it with, um, with syntax. And, and there's a reason why we do that, did that. We did it because we had teachers who, um, while I believe fluency is absolutely a bridge between reading the words and understanding meaning, a lot of teachers were having children read words um, to increase their words correct per minute, and they were getting kids to practice reading and rereading text to up the words correct per minute scores, and they weren't necessarily helping the kids focus on the prosody, on the phrasing. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about why that's so important in terms of comprehension and really in terms of writing too. So here's our new bridge um, with the syntax in lieu of the fluency. And the syntax is really going to still focus on um, reading fluency, but we're going to do it by helping kids see how to phrase words and how to read prosodically. I will say though, that I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that reading fluency is incredibly important. And reading fluency referring to reading words accurately first, automatically second. And it isn't until they can do those two things that they actually can work on their phrasing and their prosody. But when you do that, you actually get a double bang for your buck, right? You get more bang for your buck because you're not only working on reading fluency, you're actually explicitly teaching them how words work, how words combine so that they can eventually be making meaning themselves without you helping them go through this questioning process. And I hope that makes sense. But I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. But before I do that, I just wanna share a little bit of research on this. Um, Joanne Carlisle and her colleague, I forget the first name of Rice, um, quite a while ago now, did a research study showing that grammatical awareness improved comprehension, but it also worked on children's memory. Um, and it helped with memory. Because some children who have working memory problems and are reading long sentences and the subject is at the beginning, but there's so much other information before you get to what the subject is doing, and then there's more information after that, and then there might be another clause or two. By the time they get to the end of the sentence, they've forgotten what they've read about. So having this grammatical awareness actually it helps with the memory issues. Um, and but you have to teach this, the children about these meaningful syntactic units, such as phrases. I've talked a lot about phrases today, the adverbial phrases, the adjective phrases. What is a phrase? A phrase simply is a group of words that work together to answer one of those functional questions that we talked about. How many, what kind, one, where, when, how, and why, okay? So those are our key questions. And when we answer those questions, sometimes we might get one word, but often we're going to get a phrase. So what you want to do before you're going to teach this whole thing called souping, to help with reading fluency and syntactic awareness, is you're going to review some phrasing patterns. You're gonna make sure your kids know about the subject. The subject is who or what the sentence is about, but it's not just one word. Usually it incorporates some adjectives, right? The predicate is what the subject is doing, right? Um, but again, it may include more than one word. We wanna make sure children know what a prepositional phrase is. Remember when I talked about prepositions, you never have a preposition alone, right? It always has words after it um, to describe um, the position and the, and the time of that particular preposition. And last but not least, you can get kids to scoop by clauses. If the clauses are short and sweet, right? a short independent clause, another short independent clause, that could be your whole, your whole scoop, right? 
um, your whole piece of the sentence. So I'm show you what that looks like. We have this one sentence and um, it has lots of phrases in it, right? And so we have the distant mountains as a noun phrase, look cold and dark, right? Is a predicate with um, descriptors, how does it look? Um, and the oranges, yellows, and golds of autumn, right? We're taking a noun phrase here that has lots of information um, and we're scooping it into three chunks. In the nearby trees and underbrush are fading to wintry browns. So this is a, a taking um, a first stab at parsing with two and three word phrases. Sometimes it's easier to start small, start with this just you know, short phrases. And then we could expand as the children can do this to longer phrases. The distant mountains look cold and dark and the oranges, yellows, and golds of autumn in the nearby trees and underbrush are fading to wintry browns. When they do this reading by syntactic parsing of the sentence, they're more apt to be making meaning, but they're also seeing the relationships between these phrases um, and among these phrases to create a good understanding of this very complex, rich sentence. Rich and descriptive, I should say. So as we talk about sentence complexity, and that's something that we talk a lot about um, now, there's so much um, research and talk about sentence complexity and deep reading. What does make a sentence complex in the first place. It's not always just the length, although the length does contribute, but you can have short sentences that are also complex and hard to understand. But Cheryl Scott, who's done a lot of research on this, come, came up with four main things that make a sentence complex. The first is something called long distance dependencies of gap and movement. What the heck does that mean? There's a long distance or a gap between the subject of the sentence and the predicate. So what is the subject of this sentence? Okay, and hopefully you said birds. And what is the predicate? Hopefully you said are. Birds are what? Extremely colorful. So if I asked you, what are extremely colorful, not you, your students, what do you think they would say? Do you think they would say birds? If you said no, they would say rainforest, you would be correct. Because there's a gap between birds and we don't get to the linking verb are right away because we have this relative clause in here describing more about the birds, a child might say birds, um, the rainforests are colorful, okay? That's one thing that makes a sentence complex. Another thing that makes a sentence complex is when you're not following what we call canonical word order, right? We don't have the subject, the verb, and the object. Scientists study planets. Right? We don't have it that way. We might have planets, right? The object are studied by scientists. So we flipped it. The dog was hit by the speeding car. So then the children are confused because of that passive tense, passive voice. Another reason for complex sentences, we have really nice descriptive noun phrases, elaborated noun phrases about clothes and curtains and furniture and odds and ends and various stages of decay. That's a, that's a mouthful, right? And it's beautiful, it's descriptive, but children might have trouble understanding that all of that goes together and all of that stuff was there. And then lastly, the number of clauses in a sentence is also going to contribute to its complexity. And so in this example, we have three clauses. The sheepdog ran to the kitchen door while the lab barked furious, furious, furiously at the cat 
who was sleeping under the table. Um, so again, uh, clausal structure does contribute to sentence complexity. The structure of sentences, though, is really important for teachers first to understand. So again, they can teach their students in child-friendly ways where kids are up and moving around and playing with the parts of the sentences and elaborating and building more complex sentences. What you have to teach them is how to figure out the relationships between the words in the sentence because those relationships are what you know, convey the meaning. And authors are sometimes really good at writing good, you know, wonderful, uh, cohesive sentences and sometimes not so much. So we wanna make sure our teachers first understand the types of sentences and what makes a sentence simple, where it has a subject and a verb or a subject and a predicate. Sometimes you have the object, sometimes you have adverbs, you know, more than one adverb, but this, even though it's a long sentence, is still considered a simple sentence. Compound sentence has two independent clauses. Usually those independent clauses are joined with a fanboy, in this case, but, but you also can have independent clauses that are joined with a semicolon, okay? And then a complex sentence is a sentence that has has to have an independent clause, at least one, and it has to have at least one dependent clause. It can have more than two clauses, but it has to have at least one of each. And the dependent clause begins with a subordinating conjunction, like when, okay? And in the example that we used at the beginning of this session, we had as, and that was the beginning of our dependent clause about the hunter. Now, in addition to teaching about the simple, the compound, the complex, we also have to teach our students about punctuation. And children who have attentional issues are famous for reading right through the punctuation. It's like it doesn't exist, they don't see it. And if they don't see it and read it, right, not literally, but read what that punctuation means, they're going to miss the gist of the sentence. For example, um, the student who read, could it be Jack wondered an earthquake and just kept writing reading. This is an, an actual example. Um, didn't know that that didn't make any sense uh, because he wasn't reading the quotation marks, the question mark, um, you know, at the end of the sentence. So that's really important to teach about punctuation. Uh, just for a second, just for fun, let me check my time, see how much time I have left. Um, take, a, take a look at this and punctuate the first sentence. So you could have said, father called Billy a football, or father called Billy a football. So depending on where you put the quotation marks, you do need the quotation marks probably, and you do need some commas in here uh, because you're not gonna call Billy a football, I hope anyway, unless you happen to have a pet football that you named Billy. Uh, uh, anyway, the punctuation matters, and this is just fun to do with students. I wanna talk for just a minute about text cohesion because in the context of teaching about syntax and teaching teachers about syntax, we also want them to understand what do we mean by text cohesion. And what we mean by text cohesion is text that actually has cohesion built into it so that it's easier for children to understand. Since we're not writing all the text that children are reading, we don't have control over text cohesion. So if a text is lacking that, it's going to mean that the children are gonna have difficulty comprehending that text. Um, and so we can actually explicitly show them what we mean by this and give them pointers and activities to do to, to create that cohesion. For example, um, in this example, we have uh, referential cohesion referring to 
the overlap between the words from one sentence to another. And we have pronouns he and he here referring back to Homer, but we also have the word artist referring to Homer as an artist. Again, if children don't lose the thread and don't know who the he is in here, um, they're going to lo lose comprehension. Um, also, there's another kind of cohesion that is referred to deep cohesion. And this is really more related to how well does the passage actually convey the ideas? So again, this is a passage about Winslow Homer and how he got interested in painting and the fact that he was a naturalist too. So that comes into his painting and his work. Well, you'll see that we highlighted here um, some prepositions after some phrases having to do with a time period for 40 years, um, a, a subordinating conjunction that shows cause and effect between this independent clause and the dependent clause. So again, we want teachers to be looking for um, examples that they could see might trip their children up so that when they go to helping them comprehend the text they're reading, they can, they can show them how to make sense of the text. So no um, doing a time check. I only have 10 minutes left. So in the last 10 minutes, I do want to allow for a few questions, but I also do want to talk for a few minutes about writing, because I did say that writing is actually a imp really important way to teach syntax. And when you teach syntax in the context of writing, you build syntactic awareness and you improve students' writing ability, their ability to construct sentences that are descriptive, that are meaningful, that, are, um, that say what they want them to say. So this, um, this is based on research that teaching writing or teaching syntax in the context of writing actually is more powerful than teaching syntax as I learned it, um, identifying parts of speech. And what is the role of syntax in writing? It's to use these function-based questions that we've been talking about throughout the session. What kind, which one, where, when, and doing that provides a metacognitive dimension to help the students expand their sentences that will develop their expressive language and, and really translate to better sentences in their writing. So how does this work? It works with these metacognitive questions that I've been talking about today and adding additional questions to draw out more information. If a child just writes a simple sentence, we're gonna ask these questions to ex help them expand it. So, a couple more things uh, related to writing. We can look at their actual writing, and I recommend that you do this. Pull sentences out of their writing and look at them analytically from these two perspectives. How well can they generate sentences? And then when you pull the sentences out of their writing and ask them to tell you more about them, are they able to analyze the sentence? Is the sentence actually telling, saying what they intended for it to say? So there's two components to that. Um, I also recommend that you think about developing their concepts of grammar and syntax and supporting their writing skills by developing concepts around the types of sentences I described, the building blocks, the parts of speech that are incorporated into sentences by talking about sentence structure. So a bare bones sentence, uh, like dogs bark and an expanded sentence that tells all about the dogs that are barking and where they are and when they're barking, etc. And then lastly, really helping them understand the role that punctuation and capitalization play in the sentence structure. Um, there's two primary purposes for doing these sentence level activities. One is to boost their syntactic awareness, which like I said, transfers directly to reading comprehension and then teaching them to write these more sophisticated sentences. It also contributes and helps with editing and revising, which I know most of you teach the writing process. You wanna know, be able to give them explicit 
ways of doing that editing and revising. And some of the activities we talked about today will help with that. And we can use those queuing questions to ask um, and answer questions, the where, the when, and the how, right? Um, and what we're going to do in that process is to identify the function first. So what is the function of yesterday at dusk as the sunlight faded, right? It's answering a when question. When did the hunter pause? Um, and then identifying and labeling that part of speech. So in each of those cases, we have an adverb, but in the first sentence, it's one adverb yesterday, and the second sentence, it's an adverbial phrase, at dusk. And then the third sentence, we actually have an adverbial clause. When did the young hunter pause as the sunlight faded? Um, in the interest of time, because I know we're very close to running out of that time, and I do want to leave questions, um, well, we'll do one of these. Maybe you'll get a chuckle um, reading these syn syntax oops that were actually written in a newsletter. And another funny. And one more chuckle. So you definitely want to revise and edit your writing. Uh, make sure it's saying what you want it to say. Um, think about how syntactic awareness and the things we talked about this afternoon will really boost your children's text comprehension by teaching them the function of the words rather than a rote skill, memorizing the definition and just looking to identify them in sentences because syntax plays an incredibly important role. As I said, reading fluency, text comprehension and writing. Um, and I think that in order to do this, the last parting thought I will share with you is that you, the teacher, have to analyze the text and look for the sentences that will be problematic for your kids reading comprehension. Um, I want to share some resources with you. I mentioned William Van Cleve. His mentor was Diana Hanbury King, who's written wonderful pro, uh, books on writing. And the Framing Your Thoughts Project Read is also an excellent resource. I've listed some others here and some references that I mentioned in the course of this session. And I thank you very much for spending your late Thursday afternoon with me. I wish you all well and um, hope you have a great day at the conference tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Gillis. We do have a few questions if you're willing to take them. Absolutely, I saved four, mi four whole minutes. <laughs> four whole minutes, we'll get some in. Um, okay, so you did share with us a nice list of programs. Would you mind clicking back to that list for Not just a second? All. This one? Or this yes, one? Thank, uh, ooh, um, either one, I guess. How about that one? That one's a little simpler to read right now. Could you sort of guide participants through the age and grade levels that would be most appropriate for some of these programs? Absolutely, that's a great question, actually. Um, I think framing your thoughts starting at the top is, is, is a teacher's manual that really is about teaching children to write sentences using sentence frames and doing a lot of the things that I've shared with you today, the sentence expansion, et cetera. And theoretically, you could start doing that in kindergarten and it could help your students all the way up through the grade levels. Um, uh, Power Writing Plus, um, I believe is also, but I would, I need to check that one, is also, I believe, for all grade levels. Sentence Sense, um, I believe that one is probably more relevant for older students who actually can start writing sentence. When I say older students, probably second or third grade and up. Writing Matters is a great resource um, guide and that one would be pertinent for all grade levels, K through 12. Writing Revolution, same, uh, pertinent for all grade levels. And then Diana Hanbury King's writing skills, she has several books, so I would suggest that you Google that and, and she has books for the different grade levels.
So you want to just read the description of those books. Okay, thank you. So if I, we had a few folks asking for something that would be fairly scripted so that they, until they feel more comfortable with this um, instruction, are there any on this list that you would consider to be a little more scripted than others? Um, the, sent, the Framing Your Thoughts, I think, is pretty scripted. And actually, the book that, is, that we've based, um, or that is a lot of what I shared with you today, is based on um, our professional learning series on syntax, knowledge to practice, has, oh gosh, I bet 60 activities that are very um, scripted. You know, going, you, I shared one of them with you. So that sentence building activity is from this book and you can actually translate the activity in your classroom. And, and just by looking at it, you can kind of get a flavor for what it is. Um, but the, the person asking the question, it's a really good, important question because we have scripted programs for a lot of the components of literacy. I don't believe that we have um, one for syntax that is quite that operates quite the same way and I I think what's driving that question is teachers insecurity in their own background knowledge of grammar and syntax and not wanting to you know make mistakes and I so appreciate that sentiment and I do believe that teachers um, by using some of the resources that I've shared with you They'll build their, their knowledge of syntax and grammar, and they just you just have to jump in and start, you know, and once you do, you will start learning more and more and more. I will also point you to um, Laura Justice's book and um, her, her co-author um, called The Syntax Handbook. So it, this is not for kids, this is for teachers to build their background knowledge of syntax. And it's very comprehensive. It has reviews at the end of cha each chapter. So you can take a little test after you read the chapter to see how you do, have you retained the information. It is, it's, syntax is very complex. And the only teachers that really learn syntax well, I think are English teachers. And of course, most English teachers are working in middle and high schools, right? They're not, you don't find English teachers per se in grade school, which is again, a reason why our elementary teachers have not learned um, both the background knowledge about grammar and syntax and equally important, they haven't learned how to teach it because of that. Again, not their fault, not blaming teachers at all. It's just, you know, it's just what's happened. Agreed. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillis. I see that you've provided your email here, and we did have a number of questions we didn't get to. So I would imagine you're welcoming folks to email you with yeah, questions. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Gillis, and to all of you who attended this session. This session was recorded and will be available on the Patton YouTube channel in the future. The Patent Literacy Team will also be creating supports aligned to the presentations at the symposium to maximize the learning for families in education.